Oh yeah, we didn't check that first, did we? We should have done that really. We can always get rid of it. So we're going to record the session. So if you say stuff, you'll be recorded. If your face is on the screen, it will be recorded. Um, if that's problematic for anybody, let us know. You can always talk in the chat if you don't want to have your voice recorded or anything like that. Uh, if you want to get really clever, you could like slack us or something if that's uh, if you want to. Um, right. Okay. Let's kick off. So. Um, this is sort of shiny training. I actually do two kinds of shiny training now. I do like shiny training for people who haven't done a lot of R, which I did last week. Uh, this is shiny training for people who've done a bit of R. So I hope that describes everyone here. If you haven't done a huge amount of R, you might find it a little bit challenging towards the end, but you can still have a go. Um, hopefully, um, We'll be able to take everyone with us. The people go at different speeds, I find, um, which can be a little bit difficult to manage. But I'll try to, I'll try to keep up with the people. I'll try to make sure the people at the front have got something to do, and the people at the back aren't getting left behind. We do give the answers as we go through, so it's not like you're going to be left with a big pile of code that doesn't work and just getting frustrated. Like you can always move on to the next bit. Um, and I, as I always say, I would imagine. I mean, I haven't done this course, but I feel like if I did and something went wrong, I would probably, after the course had finished, I would keep my code and tinker with it and make it work. And that probably would help me to learn whatever it was that I didn't quite learn on the day. So I suggest you probably do that too. Um, it's in three sessions, this training, which made a lot of sense when I designed it back in the, in the before times when we all used to be in the same room. It would be like three sessions in the day. Now it's split over two days, which means we'll do one session this morning and then like half of session two, which is a bit weird, but um, session two does break reasonably cleanly. Um, and I think that's it, really. Um, we are going to start from, I know I said it's for people who've done a bit of R, but we're going to start, as far as Shiny goes, it starts from the absolute complete basics. So you and no knowledge of Shiny is assumed at all. Um, I think that's it. Just the first question is, uh, well, we'll probably get onto this, but if anyone's had any like technical problems that they know about already in terms of following the course instructions or the cloud or whatever, then please do shout up in the chat. So Zoe will be assisting me this morning. Uh, Zoe knows everything there is to know about training, really. Um, and But she won't be here tomorrow. So if you're going to have a horrible interactical problem, please have it today, not tomorrow, because uh, it's just me tomorrow. But hopefully we'll get all the technical stuff at least out of the way. Your, your laptops will all work beautifully by the end of the day at least so hopefully tomorrow will be fine um yes hopefully we won't often it's the technical issues that, that get us on training days like this rather than the actual r the writing r code is easy making it work on an nhs laptop is not easy um right okay i'll kick off now stop rabbiting so where's the window uh here it is Right. Oh, the chat's finished. Oh, I'm not going to worry about the chat. Sorry, sorry. Can please look at the chat. I can't. I can't understand where everything goes. Okay. Uh, yes, I pretty much already said all this. Yeah, and I'm. Yeah, if you do get stuck, or I think I can stick around after both sessions. I certainly can stick around after today's. I'm not entirely sure about it tomorrow, but I certainly you will be able to find me in the world after this is finished. Uh, if you if you get stuck, you can either Slack me or tweet me or email me or something. If you if there's a little bit of uh, a problem that you've had, um quite happy to help because I want to make sure you've learned everything you want to learn. Um, okay, so today, it, well, session one, I should say, as I say, we're going to do three sessions over two days. Session one is reasonably simple, I think. We're going to like just do something really basic just to get you started with like how to build the basics of Shiny applications. Then we're going to build a real application and do some little clever bits and pieces. And there's some extra stuff just in case anyone is twiddling their thumbs while I'm helping the people who are still working. It depends, it depends how it goes. It's quite a big class. So I don't know how well I'm going to be able to manage what everyone's up to, really. I think it's going to be a bit more a case of just everyone just doing what they're, whatever they're doing. But I'll do my best to try and understand where everyone is and what they're up to and so forth. Um, right, so what is Shiny? So Shiny, basically, is it's a web application programming framework which doesn't on its own mean a lot to a normal person at least um 
what that means basically is it's it's loads of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. So it, it's the language of the web basically. It is it is the web, but all calls from R. So you write functions in R that make stuff happen in HTML, which doesn't seem important, but it is kind of important because as you get better at Shiny, you'll realize that, and Shiny's really good at this, actually. I don't know how easy it was to make it like this, but it's very impressive. The way that you can actually pretty fairly seamlessly actually integrate those all, all of those different components together using as much or as little as you like. So you can just add in uh, bits of HTML, bits of CSS, bits of JavaScript as you go, um, and the rest is in Shiny. Or you can write almost the whole thing in HTML and have a little shiny bit. You can you can really do what you like, and this is I mean I my I don't know a lot of web stuff really, but all the all the web stuff I do know I learned because of shiny. So you learn a bit of like JavaScript and a bit of CSS and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's um, that's a good thing to know as you get better. You'll be able to um, be able to do more things, particularly JavaScript. There's some clever things you can do in JavaScript. If I ever do an advanced Shiny course, I will put that in. Um, I haven't. I keep threatening to do one, and I never do one. But if I do, that'll be in it because you can do some pretty clever things with JavaScript. Okay, so that's what Shiny is. So this is what Shiny does. So this is the sort of this is the like the, the example one. This, so this is like Shiny 101, and it's a histogram with some bars or bins as they're called in the trade. And you can select the number of bins right over here. And that's it. And I put this on the slide because this illustrates the basic point of Shiny, which we're going to come back to several times, which is that when the inputs change, the outputs change. And that's how Shiny works. As the input changes, the output changes. And there's a, very, there's a lot of sort of clever thinking that's gone into that. And that's why Shiny applications are so easy to write. Um, writing Shiny, once you've got the hang of it, you can write quite a lot of Shiny quite quickly. And it's because of that basic idea. And yeah, every time, every time it does that, the slide always crashes. I have to reload it. Worth it, though. Totally worth it. Right. Oh, wow, it's still crashed. Well, this is fun. I wonder if I can just do this. No, I can't. Sorry, normally it comes back to life at this point. Oh, there we go. Um... But it also does lots of other complicated things. I don't entirely know what this is, to be honest, but I just thought it was a good example of something who's made something very complicated in Shiny. Um, and you can do like lots of sort of clever um, HTML-y kind of leaflet-y sort of clever things like this. So this is quite a nice. Again, I don't really know where I got this from. Um, but these two dots here, this is quite. This is this is the crosstalk package, which was mentioned actually at the NHSR conference. For those of you who were there, I can't remember who mentioned it now. Um, but these two dots are connected together. So this is a, I guess, a ggplot, and this is a leaflet map. And they both know when you click on one, the other one knows, and it will highlight the thing that you clicked on. So that's quite cool. Um, there's a lot of kind of like, I, to be honest, I don't really know how crosstalk works, but there's a lot of kind of HTML wizardry under the hood, um, which you don't have to know any of at all, as I say. So you could build that without understanding HTML at all, which is awesome. Right, so how does Shiny work? So Shiny works, basically, it's called reactive programming. That's what it's called. And it's a thing. It's not just being invented for Shiny. It's a thing in the world. Um, and basically, what reactive programming is, is that when the input to something changes, the output changes, like we saw with the graph. When the little slider thing changed, the graph changes. And we call that something in Shiny. We call that take a dependency on. So the graph that we had uh, with the different numbers of bins takes a dependency on the slider. And what that means is it knows. So it will listen out for when this. So it will say to the slider, every time you change, I want to know, because part of me is based on what, what part of you. And so let me know if you change, and then I'm going to change. And that's all done automatically. That's the point of reactive programming, is that it's all done automatically. You don't have to tell it. Just the mere fact that the graph has got the, the, a reference to that input in it is enough for it to know to change when the input changes. And it's all done for you. Um, so for those of you who haven't done other programming not uh, outside of R, it's possible it doesn't sound like very much, really. Um, but for those of you who have, you will realize that in lots of other languages, um, 
you don't have that kind of thing. So, for example, I learned Java years ago, um, and you have to all that kind of stuff. You have to do you have to do by hand. So, if you want something to change when something else changes, you have to tell it. You have to write code that says every time that guy over there, you have to write all these little things, which is fine. It's not difficult to do. It's just loads and loads and loads of code. So that's why Shiny is so quick and easy, because all of that stuff is done for you. Um, so that's the good thing about Shiny. There is a bad thing about Shiny, and that is that precisely that, that it's all done automatically. And because it's all done automatically, sometimes Shiny does stuff that you don't want it to, because it just takes all the power out of your hand. So it'll just do whatever it thinks. Um, so for example, CRUD applications, and I to this day can't remember what CRUD stands for, create something, update and delete. I think like a database application. And you can build them in Shiny, people have, but it's fiddly, and I, I and I should know because I've tried it. Um, and the reason for that is because when you write in a database application, the order that things happen in is really, really important. So if you update the user interface before the data has gone into the database, the data will know if it never goes into the database. So you press a button and the inputs disappear and then the database updates, then the database is updating with nothing and therefore it won't update. Um, and Shiny will do things like that because it will if things are happening simultaneously, Shiny just decides. It doesn't tell you. It doesn't ask you. It doesn't do anything. It just makes it. It just says, I'll have that one, and then that one, and then that one. Um, and that's not always what you want. And there are some other things that it does as well sometimes that can be tricky. However, having said that, there are ways around that. So sometimes when you write in Shiny, it will do something that you don't quite want it to because it's automatic. And then there are R functions, um, which I don't, again, which I don't have time to go into today, but would be in an advanced course that allow you to stop it from doing that. Um, at a certain point, Shiny's doing lots of things automatically for you, and then you're writing loads and loads and loads of code to stop them from doing it automatically. At a certain point, you've got to ask yourself whether Shiny is really the right language. So sometimes you will see people on Stack Overflow or somewhere saying, I'm trying to do such and such a thing in Shiny. And the correct answer to the question is, don't do it in Shiny. Shiny is not designed to do what you're doing. You'd be better off learning something else and doing it in that if you can. Um, but that's a sort of a judgment thing. What Shiny is really good at is doing stuff, you know, building dashboards quickly. That's what it's really good at. Okay, so that's how it works. Right, so how do you write Shiny applications? So back in the day when I started, which I think was, when was it, 2013 maybe? I don't know. In the early days of Shiny, there was only one way of writing Shiny applications, and that was with two files. Um, but then they introduced single file applications, and that seems to be the way that people are doing stuff now. Um, personally, I've never really used single file applications because I just don't like that much code on one code file. It's as simple as that. No other reason, really. But if you read Hadley Wickham's Mastering Shiny book, it's all single code files. I don't think he even mentions the fact that you can even do two code files. So I'm going to teach single file today. I'm just telling you that you can do it in two files if you want to. I think once you found your feet and you're writing your own shiny applications, you can you can you can make your own mind up. Personally, without wanting to overcomplicate things, actually I don't do any of this anymore because I use Golem, which again is a subject for an advanced course, which is another thing again. But don't worry about that for now. All I'm saying is I've sort of opted out of that whole debate by actually doing something entirely different, but that's kind of by the by really. Um so yeah, so we're going to do single file today. So let me just describe how they both work for you anyway, though. So if you write a two file application, one of the files is called server.r and the other file is called ui.r. Now the server.r file has got all the kind of processing in it, all the kind of what you'd recognize as R code, really, all the like graphs and statistics and summaries and, you know, all your dply R code and, you know, all that kind of thing, like the, the guts of it. Um, and the ui.r is the user interface. So that'll say, you know, put an input over here and then have a little tab here and then a table and it will lay everything out and say, give names to things and say where they are on the page. That's what they do, basically. So that's how a two file application will work. An app.r single file application is the same. It's just they just have a bit that says um, this is the UI and this is the server. We'll see that in a minute anyway, um, as I say. And there's a wizard that you don't need to worry too much about precisely how you you know, do them. I'm not sure I could do it from scratch myself, quite honestly. Um, there's a wizard which we're going to use throughout the course and which you'll use for the rest of your life. Um, so you don't need to worry about 
exactly what the code looks like. Um, and it's worth saying as well, and I will probably come back to this, but just in case I don't, um, it's useful to understand how Shiny applications work when you're thinking about this. So the way that a Shiny application works, and you'll see this when you write applications that take a little while to load, you can actually sort of see the whole thing building up. So the UI bit, whether it's a code file or whether it's the section of a single file, is loaded first and it's only loaded once. It just loads. It's the first thing that happens and it's never touched again. So it will build the user interface and then it's done. It will never touch that code again. Then it goes to the server thing. And then all the reactivity, all the changes are all done in the server thing. And that's useful to know because A, it can help you to understand what's going wrong. If you've got like a bug or something, you can kind of say, well, we haven't even got to the user interface bit. So that suggests possibly there's a problem with the user interface. But also it helps you to understand that you can't access, you can't get values from the server bit back into the UI because it's never run again. There's no there's no way back. The user interface is drawn once and that's it. Now there are ways around that. You can build dynamic user interfaces, which we're gonna cover in this course, um, but it's still just worth understanding at a basic level that it draws the UI first and then that's it. And then it moves on. Just, um, just to help you to understand the kind of the processes that it's going through. Okay, right. So that's how you set the code files up. Now let's just talk about how you actually do it, how you write Shiny. Um, so basically, you define a load of inputs um, using special functions that have different names in the UI. Like we saw the little slider input that's got one, and like text, and there's lots of different types of inputs. And you give them all a name. And then you define some outputs, like a graph or a table, and you say, I want it here, or I want it over here, or I want to split the screen in half and have one here, and whatever it is. And you give them a name as well. And that's all your UI does, basically. It defines the inputs and outputs and gives everything a name. And then once you've done that, the server uh, bit, either, this, either the file, the server file or the server half of the single file, um, uses those names to say how the inputs, how the outputs are drawn and also accesses the inputs using this notation. So the notation, this is what this is the most important bit. I wonder if I can highlight. Yeah, here it is. So this input dollar sign name of input, that's how you access uh, an input. So with the, with the graph that we saw before with the histogram, um, I think it's input dollar sign bins, we'll see in a minute. So if you want to get the number that that refers to, you just write input dollar sign bins in your output and it will draw the graph based on that. Um, it's a lot simpler to understand if you, um, if you uh, browse the code, which we'll do now. So let's all do this. So I'm going to um, just unshare and then I'm going to, oops, see Daisy, press the wrong button. So I'm just going to just share my screen, share my other screen, I mean. Um, share screen. Yeah, here it is. OK, so well, the slides have gone now, haven't they? That's the problem with doing this, isn't it? You can't have the slide. Oh, this is what's so difficult about online. Honestly, teaching people shiny is much easier than faffing around with Zoom. Um, <laughs> no, I will. Okay, <laughs> I'm not going to do it that way. I thought I'd cracked it, but I haven't ever. I haven't cracked it at all. I think you can put them both on the same screen because you've got them in. Um the slides and the R Markdown one, so they, they resize, don't they? So I've been sharing split screens before with coding in R Studio and slides on the other side. They should fit together. Yeah, you mean half a, half a web browser and half an R Studio? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. It does make it a bit awkward for those on laptops because it makes it much smaller. But it is recorded and it will be on YouTube, so I think you might be able to, well, maybe possibly be able to zoom in. But um, I'll get the slides to share so that people could probably follow separately. Yeah, so I think, well, everyone's got the repo, haven't they? That was in the joining instructions, right? It was. I can share it again. Yeah. So, yes. So you've got the slides. So I'm sorry, there's a lot of faffing around with Windows and stuff. And I feel like I should get better at it. I haven't. And I think it's too late because I've often done this like six or seven times now, and it's just as bad as it was the first time I ever did it. Um, 
but you've got all the information. So if you want to look on your computer, you can just ignore me and just look at it yourself. But I'm going to try and put everything on the screen so everyone can see what I'm doing. Um, right. Let's try again. I'm glad to have finally given up my dream of, of doing this perfectly. It, it feels good, actually, just to, just to accept that this is as good as I can do it. That looks right, well, good. Just close my teams in case people start sending me lots of embarrassing messages about all the horrible work I've done recently. Okay. Um, yes, so this is what we're going to do. So everyone do this. So we're going to go to File. We're going to go to New. And I say, this is what you're always going to do. This isn't for today. This is for the rest of your career. And you go to Shiny Web App. It just, because it, it does all the boilerplate for you. That's why it's so useful. Because, again, in the bad old days... You know, we used to like, co you know, copy it out of a, and that, you know, that's a bit faffy and annoying. So don't do that. Yeah. So file new shiny web app and it will pop up and it will say, give your application a name and it will go in a folder with that name. Um, so let's just call this minimal. And then as you can see here, you see it's got the single file and the two file. So you can do either, as I say, personally, I really and truly, I prefer two file, but I'm teaching single file because that's what Hanley Wickham does and I'm disinclined to argue with him on YouTube. Um, but if you want to copy what I'm doing, then do single file today and then you just click create. Oh yeah, you obviously select a directory. I've already done that, I'm in temp, but you can put it wherever you put it, just put it wherever you like, but just make sure you know where it is. And it'll pop up like that. And that's really useful. I'm going to say this probably repeatedly. Shiny is really hard to debug. So it's really important that you start off with something that you know works. So using this this wizard is a really good way. Let's just get rid of all this boilerplate at the top. We don't need that. So this works. So it's just useful to start with application because that means that then if you, you know, if you write something that doesn't work, then you broke it kind of thing, rather than you started with something that didn't work if you copied the code out somewhere else. So this works. Um, right, so. Let me just show you how it all works. So this is the UI definition. As I say, you don't need to worry too much about all this stuff. You can start to understand more about what it is and so on. And I'm gonna pick up, pick this up a little bit in session two and three. But quite honestly, you can just sort of just leave that as it is, and it doesn't. It's not terribly important that you understand that what, what it is. Um, the important part really is this is this is one of the layout functions, and again, you don't need to worry about this too much. Let's we're going to start with this, and then by the end of the course, we'll be doing some other stuff that's not this. Um, and basically, all the sidebar layout function does is it takes two arguments: sidebar panel and main panel. And they are uh, the, the they are the, the the traditional shiny application which you're used to seeing. So if I just click the runner app, actually I'll show you. So this is the sidebar panel. You know everyone's seen shiny application. I'm sure if you've seen one, you've seen one that looks like this. So this is the sidebar panel, and this is the main panel, and that's basically how it works. So anything you put in here will appear here, and anything you put in here will appear here, and that's basically it. Let's just press stop. So. Let's just have a look at the input function, see how they work. So this is an input function. This is the slider input. That's that thing with the, you know, reading left and right. And all shiny inputs start with this, which is this is the thing that shiny is going to call it. So you give this a sort of some sort of reasonably sensible programmatic type, you know, variable type name like that. And the second argument is what the user will see. So this obviously will be like a nicely labeled with punctuation and capital letters and all that kind of thing. And then these arguments vary depending on the on the type of input. And you obviously you just need to look in the uh, documentation if you forget. But the important thing that I'm trying to teach you really at this point is just that this is what Shiny thinks it's called. And this is the label that your user sees. And this down here is a plot. So they're all the different output functions. All the different types of output have different output functions. So Shiny ships with a few, the main being text, plot, and table. Um, but there are loads, but they will tend to go with the package that they go with. So, for example, leaflet has got its own and it's leaflet output. So just remember that if you're drawing leaflet maps, I've made this mistake many times. You just forget and you think, oh, leaflet, that's a plot. So you use plot output. It won't work because I don't even know why, to be honest, because I don't know how leaflet works. But it won't work. It won't draw anything. You need to use you need to use leaflet output. So you need to use the output function that goes with the output that you're drawing. 
Um, and this is the name. So again, this is what Shiny thinks it's called. And it doesn't need anything else, this, because it doesn't have a label, because it's just a big area of the screen, basically. So there's no need, there's no, there is no user label for this. So that's that. So as I, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning, this is drawn first. So it will draw all this. And then having done that, it will then go, well, I need to find out what everything is now. So it will say, well, I don't know what this is. This is some sort of plot. So let's go and find out what it is. So then it will go to the server file to look it up. And as you can see, the server file, all the outputs are defined like this, output dollar sign, like that, and then the name. So you can see the name here is here, and it's here. And again, you have a, a different function for every type of thing. So there's a render plot function, there's a render text function, there's a render table function, and again, there are other leaflet and, or there's millions, I can't remember what they all are, but there's, you know, there's loads of different types of weird HTML outputs you can have in R, and they've all in Shiny, and they've all got their own um, their own function. And then you want, don't forget the curly brackets, because that allows you to have multi-line. I think it will work without the curly brackets, without multi-line, but... It, you know, don't do that because then if you add another line, it'll break and you'll forget why. And it's just not a very good idea. So you want to uh, open with round brackets, then open with curly brackets. Then you can write whatever the heck you like in here. You can have as many lines as you like. You can do whatever you want. You just have to finish with a statement that draws a graph. Now, this is a base R graph. I don't know. There are probably some people in the world who are not familiar with base R graphs, which is a bit unfortunate. But this is the wizard. And it does mean there are no package dependencies for this code, of course, which I suppose is good in its own way. Um, and the shiny bit of this is this. So I mentioned this earlier. So the outputs are defined output dollar sign. The inputs are defined input dollar sign. So this is input dollar sign bins, which is, of course, this thing up here. So what this is saying is um, this value comes from here. And as I mentioned, this is the taking the dependency. So this this function knows now that it's based on this. So it will, it will take a dependency on it and update whenever this updates. And you can see here, this is just calculating the, quite honestly, I can't remember how the bins argument works and I haven't drawn a histogram in base R for years. Um, but whatever that's doing, it's it's using the value input bins. And you can see it's just here, there, like that. Then it draws the graph. And there's this at the bottom. As I say, just don't touch it. It doesn't matter, you know. You don't just don't touch any of this, basically. Right, that's it. Is there any like questions in the chat, or anyone want to ask anything or anything like that? Everyone happy? Just if you're not happy, then shout up, and Zoe will um, throw the brakes on. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to do we're going to do some shiny. Uh, so we're going to add a title to the graph. We're going to add a title that you can type in, and so here it is. So this is the this is the oopsie daisy. This is the way that we draw uh, inputs to the uh, text input. Sorry, this is the text input function, and you just need again you need what shiny thinks it's called, and what the label for your user. And we're going to add this to sidebar input over here. Not sidebar input. There's no such thing as sidebar input. Sidebar panel, and then we're going to add main equals input dollar sign name to the histogram. So just for those of you who haven't drawn any graphs in base R, the way you add a title to a graph is where you write main equals string. Um, as I say, it's possible some people have never done it. So I'm just telling you, um, that's how you do it. Um, so that's it. So if you feel like you want to just have a go and ignore me, then please do have a go and ignore me. Uh, and Or you can just uh, follow along. And I'll, I'll show you the uh, what we're going to do. So we need to add an input. So we, as I say, we're going to add it in the side. You don't have to add inputs in the sidebar panel. You can put whatever you like, wherever you like. But users will often expect the inputs to be on the side, but they don't have to be. Um, so let's add a text input. Text input. Let's call it, what should we call it? Let's call it title. And let's uh, put a nice friendly label to the user. Like that, add a title. And then all we need to do is we need to go to the histogram function and we just need to add in the main argument. So we're now going to write main equals, and we're not going to write a string. We're going to write a reactive input from Shiny. We're going to write input dollar sign. I can't remember what I call it now, title. 
they put dollar sign title on. And that's it. And hopefully if we run, I don't think I've messed it up, although I might have done. Press run. And there it is. And hopefully you can add a title. Uh, I can't remember what this is. I think it's number of eruptions or something, isn't it? Per, I don't know what it is. Some built-in data set. And there you can see, you know, quite clearly that it's reactive every time you do anything at all. It updates. Like that. So that's it. That's it at its most simple level. That's how you do Shiny. Right, is everyone okay so far? Cool, cool, cool. Okay, right, well, let's keep going then. Okay, so now we're going to build one from scratch. We're going to make it a lot... Um, we're going to um, make it a bit more interesting now. So... Um, right, let me just expand my R Studio for now, actually, just so I can... Oops. Uh, <laughs> need like a qualification in Zoom. That's what I need. <clears throat> oh, I kind of want to show the other window. Actually, don't I really? Yeah. It gets a little bit confusing. Again, this is all confusing. I'm sorry. It's just too many windows and computers. So. You will have a copy of the repo and you can mess around inside the repo and draw and do what you like. But I can't do that because if I do, if I start messing around in the repo, I'm obviously going to break my own code and then it won't work. And then when I try and show you something, it'll be broken. So I've actually got two R studios open at the same time. So I'm just going to show you the one that I'm not touching because it's the one that you're looking at, if you see what I mean. And I'm going to hide it again because I'm got to keep it nice. Let's just zoom in the text a bit in a bit. I just want to explain to you what everything is. Because this is going to be important for the rest of the. Uh, let me just get rid of one of my things because I've got. A... Oh, okay. Well, I don't know why I was doing that, but anyway, it's not two columns. There we go. So this is the repo. Um, we're gonna, yeah. So we're gonna open an app. We're gonna there's a there's a folder called sitrep first in here. And this is the answer to the question. This is, and this is the data that you need as well. So this, this shiny contact data, you're going to need to copy this wherever we draw, at wherever we make this application that we're building now. Because we're going to build, we're going to work on it for a little while. So you're probably going to, depending on, it depends how you do it. You see, this is why I'm tying myself and not trying to explain it to you. If you want to have like an individual folder with each version of the Shiny application, you're going to need to copy the data file to each folder. But if you just want to just draw on top of the one you've already got, you're only going to need to do that once. But I'll leave that with you. You can obviously organize your workspace the way you choose. Um, it's just more confusing for me because obviously I've got to keep everything clean. Anyway, so this is what it does. So I'm just going to show you. Um, although, of course, as soon as I show you, it'll make, break my slides, won't it? So... Almost we need three windows open at this point. No, there's just no. Hang on. Um, you could show the code if you're showing the code, the GitHub code. Um, is that what you're showing the answer? I think I'll just move this out of the way. It's just because the slides are running in the other R Studio session, so I almost need three sessions open. Computers get overheated then, don't they? Uh... Right, here it is. So it looks like this. Yeah. Okay, so this is what we're going to build. So there's a table and a graph, and 
there are some filters over here that are, it, it, this is I'm using this because this is a real application that I built. So it, just to illustrate the point that you can build stuff that people actually use fairly simply. So this is I mean, I've I've mangled all the data. Not that it's particularly sensitive data anyway, but I just mangled it anyway just for the sake of it. I think it's like number of appointments or it's something I can't remember what it is. It doesn't really matter. Um, but people do actually use this and you can like filter by year and stuff and you can filter by what happened with the appointment, that kind of thing. So that's what we're going to build. Uh, and so you've got the answer in a folder called sit rep first. And then you have got um, some code to help you with it in a code file called sit rep first. So there's always going to be a folder called something or other, which I'll tell you what it is called. And then there's a code file with that same name that's got some example code rather than just staring at you know, rather than just having the whole answer right in front of you, just to give you a chance just to kind of read it and have a bit of a think about it. Um, yeah, like this. Um, and in almost all cases, I'm going to give you the whole server file like this. So this is all of the code for the server. Um, and the reason I do that is because there's no, I'm not teaching you like ggplot or dplyr or, you know, like it doesn't matter what's in here. You can probably read it reasonably easily, but if you can't, don't worry about it. It doesn't really matter. Um, the point is just that it's got reactive inputs in it. As long as you can, as long as you understand how to manipulate them and what they mean and how it works and all that kind of stuff, it doesn't really matter whether you understand what the output code is actually doing. Obviously, you're in your applications, you'll be writing the server code. So you'll, of course, I'm sure understand it very well. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to build this, which is now grayed out because I press stop uh, using this code as an example. So as I say, just as always, feel free to chew me out at any time. If you feel like you want to just chew me out and have a go, then please do. Um, and if you feel like you want to just um, have a look at what I'm doing, then please do that as well. So is it worth leaving the slides up? Have they got, oops, have they got any useful information on them? Uh, this is all just the stuff that I just said, I think. Well, let's see what up anyway. I think I don't need the whole Windows code in anyway. Okay, so we're going to go from scratch. So the way we go from scratch is we're going to use the wizard again. So I'm just going to go to File, New, New File, Shiny Web App. I'm going to create another thing in temp again. Let's call this sit rep first. Oops. There. OK, now it's a little bit artificial. I'm going to apologize now because having the server file defined for you does make the exercises a bit artificial because you've kind of got to sort of write the code the way I wrote it. There's no way around that, really. Short of getting you to write your own server code, which I think would be a massive waste of time, would probably lead to loads of bugs. I can't think of any way around it. So I'm sorry, this isn't going to be exactly like it is when you're doing it for real life, but I think it's pretty close. So the first thing we're going to do, actually, let's just pop this out for now. This is the code. This is the example code that we need. Oh, I might leave that up, actually. That's better, isn't it? So the first thing to do is just copy the server file across. So we're just going to take these two functions, the graph function and the table function. And we're just going to just, well, let's delete. Let's do this cleanly so we don't make any mistakes. Let's delete that. We don't want that. And then let's copy this code and put it in here. So now we've got a shiny application that's got all of the server code in and nothing else. So this obviously will not work because Shiny doesn't have a clue what any of this stuff is. It doesn't know what the inputs are. It doesn't know anything. So obviously this is, and as I say, this is where it's a bit artificial because you would never actually do this in real life. It doesn't make any sense. But now we're going to make it work. And the way we're going to make it work is with these three functions. So select input is um, a little pick list thing. What you get on, you'll be familiar with them from the web where you, it says like, um, what would be an example of that? You know, select like your occupation or something. It would say, you know, like whatever, management, healthcare, sales, or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, DT output is a way of drawing these nice tables. Uh, it's disappeared now. Um, 
the tables that we saw all over there again. Don't kill me, what? <clears throat> like this. This is a, it's, it's just a package in R basically. And it, it, it allows you to like sort and like paginate and all this kind of thing. You can like select the number of entries and stuff as well. Although it's very much a thing because we haven't selected enough for years. I always use DT. I never use normal tables because they're just a bit ugly. I like DT, so we're going to use that. So we're going to use that and the UI. I'm going to use that in the plot output. Just note as well, I've done it for you, but of course you'll notice here, this is, you know, I said before about they have each have a special function. So this is the, this is the DT function, render DT. So that's provided for you. It's just worth noticing that it's there. Just so you start to get used to the idea of picking the right function. Okay, cool. Right, let's do it. So again, let's get rid of the inputs. We don't need this. And let's get rid of the output. We don't want that either. So we've now got some server code and a totally empty UI definition. So uh, let's add everything back in again. So um, we want to add in the select import and we want to add in basically a selection for year and status here. And again, as I say, this is obviously artificial because you left thinking what the heck is this? Whereas if you'd written it, you wouldn't be thinking that. Um, so let's just have a look. I'll just load the data just so you can see uh, what we're looking at so you can do this yourself if you wish <clears throat> so the data looks like this so it's got all we're interested in really is this year column here well all we're interested in, in terms of inputs anyway is the year column and the status column i'm going to be filtering by those two things as you say here there's a filter here for year and there's a filter here for status so we need to define uh, an input that allows us to select based on those two variables. Uh, so, select input. Uh, so we're going to give it a name. As I say, the names are already given for you because of the way we're doing this. It's got to be year, otherwise it's not going to work. And we're going to give it a human readable name as well. Select a year like that. And then there's only other one mandatory argument in select input, and that's choices. And that just defines what the user can select from. So just for the sake of simplicity, let's just um, let's just type the years in. There's, a, there's an easy way of doing it, but let's. Uh, Let's just do this for the sake of clarity. Oh, I've written 2018 twice. Right, that's that. So that now allows our users to select a year, which is selected here, and it will have one of those one of those values, which are the values uh, from the data. So that input should work fine now. And then the other one uh, is called this status, and it's another select input, so it's the same again. Um, select input, and we're going to give it a name, status, and we're going to give it, uh, uh, let's write appointment status, like this. And then again, we need choices. Oh, I forgot to change the tile. Didn't I? That's going to irritate me. Let's change the tile. Let's call it report. Choices equals 
Now, the easiest way of doing this, and you're probably going to do this quite often in your Shiny application, so we may as well do it now, is just to use the unique function because it will obviously give you all the values of that variable. So we just write unique Shiny contact data status. And if I just run that in the console, you'll see the values it takes. Yeah, look, there they are, down here. So that's the inputs done, I think, I hope. We're going to find out in a minute when I press run. And then we just need to put the outputs on the screen. So we've got two outputs. We've got a DT output, which is defined here. And we've got a plot output, which is defined here. Again, as I say, they've already got a name. So you're going to have to use my names. Um, so we're just going to write uh, DT output with the name of the output, which is table, I think. Yep. Oh yeah, one thing I forgot to mention actually as I've been going through is you're gonna need commas after everything. When, you, when you're like in a panel or that kind of thing, that's quite a common thing. And it's quite a common bug, although Shiny actually, often the error messages are a bit confusing, but they're not all that confusing as a rule, I don't think when you're, when you're missing commas from uh, things like this. So uh, don't forget to put that. So you don't, it's just a bit confusing I think when you get started because you don't have them here because these are functions, but you do have them in the, in the, in the UI. So I don't know, maybe that doesn't confuse other people, maybe it's just me. But when I started, I used to get confused as to where I was because half the time you want commas and half the time you didn't. And I guess I didn't really think deeply about why one need one and one and the other one didn't. So you want commas when you're writing basically like lists of um, of, of uh, outputs. And then we need plot output. We need to give it a name again, which is this thing here, graph. So we're going to write graph. And that's it. So hopefully that'll work. So let's press the button and find out. Yes, and there it is. Uh, the only thing is being that I haven't, uh, this is just on the single at the moment. I just thought I'd just start with that just to show you. So you can only have one at once at the moment, which is fine for some, I mean, obviously it depends what you're doing, but sometimes you would want that. On this, but we don't really want that. We want to be able to select multiple years. So in order to do that, all we have to do is just add another argument. So we just write uh, multiple equals true. And then let's write it for status as well. <clears throat> multiple equals true. And then we're going to just press stop and run it again. Yes, so when you write, when you write multiple equals true, um, Unless you specify the, the, the beginning values, the default will be empty, which means that your user will end up staring at something that looks like this. Um, so there's a couple of ways around that. The first thing is you, you can provide um, you can provide a default value. So if you look, it'll work. If I, if I select a few things, it'll work like that. So there's two ways around that. I'm going to show you both. I'm going to show you one now. The simplest one is just to write, just to give it give a selected. Uh, so let's like this. Well, that, that, I think should work. I think I've done that right. Let's have a go. Yeah. So you can do that if you want. Or there's another way that is a bit kind of not clever. That's not really the right word. That gives you a bit more scope to kind of explain to users what's going on um, which we'll talk about later on <clears throat> so that's it so that's the first exercise um, anything in the chat anyone got any questions everyone keeping up there are a few people have just joined so I'll, I'll post some more links and things for people to catch up with um, but there are some problems for some people in the cloud building a simple app. Or the example here gives a gray screen with drop down boxes, but no chart. Right. Have they tried running the actual, the, the answer? Are they, are they running my code or are they running their own code? Yeah. That's a, so the answer is in the chat at the moment. It, well, for the first app. 
So I've done it with a basic hello world example. It goes wrong and shows us to gray screen. And with running, I think, some of your code as well. So yeah, I don't think it's... And this is the cloud, is it? Did you get into the project of the cloud? You should yes. work. Okay, yeah, yeah. I was just thinking if... Anyone else having a problem? I'm just going to have a go myself, actually. If I can get my thing to work. I'm not in the cloud, so I don't really know. <laughs> not really in the cloud. <laughs> it's a funny statement. Um, uh, could you? Um, I'm, I'm in the cloud and it's working. The first time I ran it with without the multiple equals true, I think I had what it sounds like other people have got with all gray screen. Um, but <laughs> putting in some some selections and it's working now. So that's at least one person's working in the cloud. Oh, is it? It's not giving an error thing. It just it just doesn't say anything at all. Could somebody share? Well, um, could you share the code that appears to be just giving the grey box in the chat, and I'll give it a run through as well in the cloud. I think, I mean, one thing we could maybe do is, well, I don't know, it, we could, it might be easy to have a, have a break now and just maybe just look at the technical yeah. problems, maybe for five or 10 minutes. I could pause it. I'll pause the Yeah, do you want to just pause it? Okay, cool. Um, right. Do you know after the break, I can't quite, we didn't, did we, we did finish the pre, I should know this. I'm glad that you pressed record just for me to, to record me being an idiot. Um, did we get, f oh, I've got the chat on the thing, haven't I? That's no good. Um, yeah, no, we did finish that. Exercise. Yeah, we did. Yeah, so we finished that. Exercise. I just wanted to make sure where we were. Yes, sorry. Sorry, YouTube, if this ever does make to you, to you, I apologize. Yes. So we've done that one. Everyone's got it working, except to, nothing to do with code and something to do with weird computer stuff, which is going to have to be good enough for today, I think. Right. So next thing. Um, so that's Shiny, basically. So now you know how to write Shiny applications. That's how you write Shiny applications. Everything else is just kind of um, like added wizardry. Um, there's going to be various things you're going to need to know as you write more complicated Shiny applications. And the rest of the today and tomorrow is, is basically that, is how do you build on the foundations? Um, so the first thing, I think, probably the most important thing of all past vanilla Shiny is what's called reactive expressions. So reactive expressions are um, things that change when their inputs change. So they're just like an output. So it's just like a graph. Um, except it's not an output. It's it's like a data frame or a list or it could be anything at all. It's some sort of object, some sort of thing that you need. Um, and they're really important for two reasons. The first one, the first reason they're really important is because it means that you don't have to keep rewriting your data processing code. So um, quite often in your Shiny application, you will have some sort of filtering or, you know, like filter by date or whatever it is. And then that whatever data object comes out of that will be then fed into other outputs. And the naive way of writing Shiny applications would be to put all of that data code in every single output. Every single output would do it themselves. And obviously that's a really bad idea from a programming point of view, because it means if you change the filter in one place, you now have to change it everywhere. So that is quite obviously a terrible idea. So don't do that. Um, and the other reason why it's important is because uh, the reactive expressions cache their results. So what that means is uh, if, say, three outputs depend on something and uh, the reactive expression updates, they can all access the same copy. So the reactive expression doesn't just rerun itself over and over and over again just because an output is asking for it. It reruns itself based on the inputs and then it will provide its value to anybody who asks the same output. 
So that's really useful if you're doing something that takes a while, takes a bit of data processing time, or you're hitting a SQL server or an API or anything where you don't want to be repetitively just doing the same thing over and over and over again. I mean, on a server, it's not good practice just to waste CPU cycles anyway, really, just because somebody else might be using them. Um, but uh, even on your own computer, you don't want to write applications that just endlessly, you know, hit databases and all that kind of thing, because your BI team will get upset with you. Um, so that's what reactive expressions are for. Oops, I've pressed the wrong button. Um, so this is just a sort of schematic diagram of, um, I don't know why I said schematic, that's a bit of an overblown word, isn't it? Um, this is just to show the sort of the naive approach. So you've got three outputs here and they depend on two inputs. Um, and the naive approach would be to write, as I mentioned, the data processing code in each of these, in each of these things. So every time this input changes, this would need to rerun the data code and this would need to rerun the data code as well. And every time this rerun, this would rerun, and this would rerun. And it's very wasteful of CPU cycles and it's very wasteful of code. So a much better way of doing it is like this. So what you do is you put something in the middle like this, and then you've got, and this depends on both of those. So it will update when the inputs change. Every time the inputs change, it will update. But then having updated, it will feed its new value to all of the outputs without rerunning. So, um, and they all, you know, everything again, it's all done for you. It all takes dependencies in the appropriate way. So this reactive object knows that it depends on these two things here. So every time they update, this will update. Equally, the outputs take a dependency on this. So the outputs will know when the reactive uh, updates. So input one updates, the reactive object updates, and then it will feed its value to each three, but without rerunning, it will rerun itself once and then pass the data across. So that's how you use them. So that's what we're going to do now. Um, this application, yeah, actually it's not a real application because the graph, the graph is not real. I just put that in just to illustrate this point. Um, but the table's real. Um, so this application is a, is a prime example of this because we have a table and a graph that both depend on the same data. So it's not really a sensible, the way we've written it so far is not particularly a sensible way of doing it. So what we're going to do is we're going to clean up the data we've already written using reactive expressions. So uh, again, as I mentioned before, so the answer to this question lives in sitrep second in here. And there's the data as well, just in case you need that. I said it depends what you're doing with in your own file system. And then there's some code here that will help you. So I'm just going to pop this out actually and put it over here. Let's just check what's on the rest of the slide. Oh yeah. That's the same. Well, let's have that. That's, it looks a bit neater, doesn't it? So slightly lost in all my code files now. Yeah, I guess I can, I can just copy on top of this one. Doesn't matter about this one. <clears throat> oh, let me just bring this slide up again, actually. Yeah, so this is how you do them. So you write reactive expressions. There's no output dollar sign here because it's not an output, obviously. So you just write, you just call it whatever you like. Doesn't matter. Just give it a name, some sort of sensible programmatic type name like return data. Then you just write reactive. And then again, you want to want the curly brackets. And again, you want the curly brackets because it will tolerate multi-line expressions. Um, so just do that. Don't don't faff around trying to get away with not having multi-lines. Just put just put it in. Um, and then you can have as many lines of code you want. As a, all these examples we're seeing throughout the two days are a bit artificial. They're not complex enough. They're not realistic, really. But that's just to, so we don't write loads of stupid bugs that we've got nothing to be shiny. Um, in reality, you probably have like 10 lines of code that you know did something. But the point being, at the end, you must return something. It doesn't have to be a data frame. It will usually be a data frame. It doesn't have to be. It could be like a list or a number. It could be anything. Um, and that should be that whatever happens at the end of your function, it should be that. It should be something that returns whatever it is you want. So in this case, it will be a data frame. So that's how you write them in the server code, obviously. And this is how you access them. So you just write the name here, and then you have the two curly brackets. So this is, I'm going to say this repeatedly. I say lots of things repeatedly on this course. This is a very common source of shiny bugs, so heed my words well. If you forget the brackets, it will not work. 
and you will probably get an error message that says objects of type closure are not subsetable, which obviously, as most of you know, is the classic bizarre, unintelligible R message. But it's 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 a blessing to shiny developers because it almost always means you've done that because that's the absolutely most common thing that you can do that generates that error message. I think it will always generate maybe I don't know, it depends what you do. It might be the occasions when it would say something else possibly, but it certainly will do that sometimes. Um, so just trying to remember that. I'm just trying to explain why, just to help you remember to do it. So the reason why you have the brackets is because the the analogy I was given is it's like a, it's like a it's the difference between a recipe and a and a pie. So this here, this function, this reactive function, isn't. It, it's not a thing. It's not a pie because it's got reactive inputs in it. That's why. So you don't know. So for example, if it was a pie, it might have like the filling. So it might have like, you know, cherry, apple. So that's not a pie. You can't have a pie that's got like a, you're not sure what the what the filling is. So it's a recipe. I would call that a recipe. So it's saying, this is how you make a pie. If you've got apples, this is how you make the pie. If you've got cherries, this is how you make the pie. So it's a recipe. Um, but you don't want the recipe, you want the pie. And that's what the brackets do. What the brackets do is saying, run the recipe. That's what it's saying. It's saying, call this function and whatever comes out of it, whatever pie you make, whatever the filling happens to be today, I want that pie. And that's the difference. And that will help you remember. But also it's useful to know because sometimes when you're doing more complicated things like writing modules, you will pass, you will omit the brackets because you are actually, sometimes you actually do want to pass a recipe. So that's why I'm saying it might seem like I'm making a big deal out of something that's not that complicated. I'm just trying to help you remember it, but also trying to help you understand it because when you're writing modules, very often you will pass the recipe because if you don't pass the recipe, the module isn't able to make new pies. If you give a module a pie, it's just stuck with this one pie forever. It's just like, well, I've got an apple pie, which is great, but now I can't make any more. But you need to give it the recipe and then it can make whatever pie you want it to. So just think about that brackets, is pies, no brackets, is recipes. Right, I'm going to stop talking about that. It's a bit, bit overblown that bit, isn't it? And similarly here, it's the same thing. So we're going to pass the same data. So this is quite common in shiny applications, is you just have the same data over and over again. So some of my shiny applications like they uses the same data like 30 times because it's just a load of data and it's just hundreds of different ways of slicing it. So that's it. Uh, so now we're going to do it. So as I say, as always, if you want to just tune me out and ignore me, then please feel free. And if you don't want to tune me out and ignore me, then please follow along according to your preference. Um, so we've got the, uh, I've given you the server code again. So the server code is here. Um, but you just need to just add in the, um, the, uh, the filters from the um from here so you'll see here you see this is classic you can see you can see the scope for reactive expression because this code here is identical to this code here so whenever you see that you immediately will be thinking ah yes of course i should be using reactive expressions i'm just writing the same code over and over again so that's what we're going to do we're going to add in a reactive uh value so we're just going to well, so we'll just cut and paste this in and then just fill it in like this Okay, so we want to filter like this. And then we want to group by like here. Like that. And then we're going to summarize like this. Actually, I noticed there's a non group here, and I haven't put that there, have I? Probably good practice to put an ungroup in. I don't know why I've removed it in the other one, but I think probably the reason why I've taken it out is because you don't need it. But let's put it in anyway, because it's it's good practice to put on groups even when you don't need them, just in case you do need them later on and forget. Right, so now we have a reactive function that returns this chunk here. So it will return this based on these reactive inputs like this. Which is good, that's what we want. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go um to uh, these and tidy them up. So we don't need all this boilerplate code anymore. We can get rid of this. 
So now we now we can return this whole thing just from here. Then all we need to do is we just need to put this into here, like that, and then we can just get rid of all this, like that, and then ditto here. We can get rid of all this stuff at the top, like that. I've forgotten the brackets. There you go. You see, look, I forgot the brackets. Told you. <laughs> brackets. Actually, tell you what, let's leave them out. Let's just see if that error message was right. Let's see. I'm pretty sure it was just that. Let's, let's find out. It's good to learn about um, fixing bugs when you're learning Chinese. So let's just move that out of the way. Press run. Oh, no, I need to press stop first. Uh, no, it hasn't actually, has it? No. Oh yes, no applicable method applied to. Yeah, yeah. So that this is another common error message. This actually, this is quite useful. This. If you see this no applicable method and you see the, all this stuff, that's another classic example. I think it depends what you're doing with it. Actually, yeah. I think um, I think if you if you try and use a dollar sign with it, actually, you get the objects of type closure are not subsetable. If you try and apply a function to it, you get this. I think that's it. Anyway, let's put it back in and hopefully that will work. And there it is. Right, so that's it. So that's your actual expression. So let me just recap. So um, this is the way you write them. Reactive, normal brackets. What's a better word for normal brackets? Round, round brackets. Yeah, round brackets. Round brackets and curly brackets. Anything that returns something or other. It's usually a data frame, not always. Sometimes you might want a list or even something else other than that. Um, and then you call them with the brackets, as I say, because you don't want the recipe, you want the pie. And then you can just call them whenever you need them. So you can see we've done that here. We've added all this boilerplate code here that was all doing the data stuff we put in the reactive expression. And then we've added it here and here. Chris, there's a comment in the chat. I'm not sure if you have that open no well. i can't let me see if i can where should is the chat the, well it just says should there be an underscore in that example code should there be an underscore the, the return data object that you're doing in the first one return underscore data has an underscore in it does that not need to match the name of the function oh yes that's a good point no it doesn't that's a good i'm glad you said that though no it doesn't because this it, it doesn't matter what this is called um it'll just return it'll return whatever's in here it will just return and call it this so it doesn't matter what this is in fact even if we, if you assign it so i'll give you an example so if you write i'm pretty sure this will work let's just find out so this is wrong really because you're you're assigning inside a reactive function but you don't want to so what you really want to be doing is this you just want to be returning it and when you're returning it it doesn't really matter what it's called it will just you know like coming out of a function whatever you've got it'll just pop it out and say there it is it doesn't come out with the name the name is given here but if you do assign it i think shiny i don't know if this is shiny or r that's helping you actually to be quite honest but i think because i've made this mistake before even if you assign it which is wrong because we're not trying to assign we're trying to return I think it will just know what you mean and just let you get away with it. So let's find out. Yeah, so it's quite happy with that. Cool. Thank you. Does that make sense? You see, so this name could be anything because it's not it's not the name that's important. It's the it's the thing that's important. So it, all it does is just ignores the fact that you've done this. It just says. Some, In fact, I think you can do yeah. make lots Sorry. of strange mistakes like this. I think you can do things like this. 
I think this is R, isn't it? This isn't shiny that's helping you. I think it's R. I think basically if the last thing you do is assign, it returns it for you without asking. No, no, that doesn't work, does it? No, okay, that one doesn't work. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know why one works and one doesn't. I'm sure it's some Irish thing that I'm not clever enough to understand. There's another question. Yeah. Would the data always be pre-existing in the environment? For example, we don't read in data in the reactive function, for instance. Oh, yes. Another quest good question. No, absolutely not. No. Um, uh, I wonder if I can show a real example. The problem with real examples is they tend to be a bit overcomplicated. Let me just quickly try and show you. I, think I always think it's good to try and kind of show realistic stuff if possible. Because I've got quite a nice thing that um, that hits a database that I could show on GitHub. Um, uh, yeah, that's not really reactive though, is it? Yeah, that doesn't really quite count. No, sorry, that example doesn't really illustrate the point. Um, Well, I'll tell you what, let's, let's just copy some random code in that sort of illustrates the point, but actually in, in real, it doesn't really work like this in the real code, but it could. So I've got some code somewhere from on my GitHub that does this. Um, that's a bit ugly, isn't it? Let's, uh, let's just tidy that up a bit. Oops. Yeah, so this is a good example of what you're talking about, uh, having some sort of data thing. Um, so as you can see here, I'm reading from a, this is from reading from a database. So this is a real application. I say it's not quite reactive in the, in the, in the real application, but it could be, it just isn't because it's just easier to do it the way that I have done it. Um, so you can see here, we're connecting to a database. Um, we're um, getting some stuff. This is one of our internal functions that does some jiggery poker with the data and then that data is itself then um has all this stuff applied to it um so yeah that's not a, a perfectly realistic example but yes um i mean when you're designing china applications it all depends on how how reactive you want it to be and it kind of depends how much data you've got how fast the database is and all this kind of thing quite often it's easier just to get loads of data once and just keep it and then filter it in which case you wouldn't do this because this is going to hit the database every time but if you've got a database with like 20 million rows and you only want you know two thousand of at a time which some of our clinical applications none of which are open source although they will be hopefully one day um if you've got a massive like production database but you only want little tiny bits. This is going to be a really effective way of doing that. The naive way of doing it will be to just download the whole thing. Um, but that's obviously going to take a long time to download. So it's going to take a long time for the application to start up and it's going to consume a colossal amount of memory. As you all know, R is not the most sympathetic of um, environments in terms of memory and stuff. So uh, you have to kind of be a bit careful really. I hope that answer well, that was a bit rambly, that answer, wasn't it? But yes, the short version of that is yes. Can I just get rid of all this weird stuff that I've drawn everywhere? Cool, okay. Everyone happy with reactive expressions? I say they're extremely important. You'll be writing them immediately, as I would think, as soon as you start writing Shine, shine applications. So, um, it's a good thing to get right. Okay, well, we're coming up for lunch, I think, now. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's the answer. We've just gone through all that. Um, oops, get rid of that. Um... Okay, so yeah, so I think what we're going to do now is I'm just going to just
talk to you a bit about debugging. And then there's a couple of, then there's a little extra thing that I want to show you. And there's some extra material. You might not need to, um, you can basically, you could do the extra material today if you want to, or just in the future. It just depends how the timing works, really. I just wanted to, to be kind of raw material in here for you to uh, have a read through and understand and think about. So uh, you can kind of come to it as you wish, really. Um, okay. Let's just make the window big. Right, debugging. So I'm going to talk about debugging a lot, I hope, or I'm, I'm certainly mean to, if uh, because debugging Shiny is hard, basically. Um, there are two reasons why debugging Shiny is hard. Well, there's probably more than two, but there are two main ones. The first reason why debugging Shiny is hard is because the error messages are weird, and that's no criticism of Shiny. I'm sure it provides the error messages just as good as it's possible to return, but because of the way that it works, and because some of the things are kind of operating through several layers of kind of interactivity, the error message that you're looking at doesn't really necessarily relate to the actual thing that's wrong. And obviously you do get that in other contexts as well, but I think Shiny is particularly good at giving you error messages that relate to thing an object that was created three steps before the one you think it is. So that's the first reason that debugging Shiny is hard. The second reason that debugging Shiny is hard is because unlike normal R, you can't just step through it line by line in a normal way. It's like a black, you know, it's a black box essentially. You set it running and it does stuff. And it's very difficult to kind of break it apart and stop it and put new values in. And you can't do that in the way that you can. When you're writing normal code, you can just pick it apart and take bits out and faff around with them. You can't do that in a shiny application. You can't just reach in and mess around with the, with the numbers. And so debugging shiny is hard. Um, so what can you do about that? The first thing you should do about that is start simple. So I already said this, start with a shiny application that the wizard drew because that works. So if your shine application doesn't work at any point, you know it's because you broke it. So that's that's a useful thing straight away. Run it every time you do anything. Don't do what I do regularly because I get cocky and write loads and loads and loads of code and go, oh, it's fine. And then press the button, it doesn't work. And then you get a weird error message and you've no idea. Could anything in the last, anything that in the last 20 minutes that you did might have broken it. Don't do that. Um, just press the like run it all the time run it more often than you even you think you need to because you never know you'd be surprised how easy they are to break so that's starting simple the second thing to do and this sounds probably more obvious than it is but you see this problem a lot and i get this problem you see on stack overflow and i meet people in real life who have this problem is they write some code that does not work inside a shiny application and it does not work inside the shiny application and they spend hours debugging the shiny trying to figure out what what reactive value are and so on and so forth but in actual fact the code doesn't work at all it doesn't work anywhere it doesn't work with static values so don't ever do that don't i mean i do it all the time um because i'm an idiot but don't you do it all of your everything you write should be written outside of shiny and made and you're like this definitely works this graph works with these inputs it works and only then do you put it in the shiny application and then obviously if you follow that rule you will know that you're like well the graph works outside of shiny and it doesn't work inside of shiny so clearly there's something shiny-esque about the problem that still doesn't really tell you whether it's shiny as such or whether it's just because you're given a different value and you should have tested it with a different value so shiny is giving it a three where you tested it with a four and it works with a four but not a three or whatever but it helps. It helps you to, to eliminate some possibilities to check. So do that. Use cat. So cat is really useful for Shiny because it will write stuff to the console. So let me demonstrate. I fixed probably hundreds of bugs using this. And I've met people in my life who've written Shiny applications and didn't know this, which I find staggering. I'm impressed that they can because I honestly don't think I could have done it. I think I would have just given up in frustration. So imagine you've got a problem, and this is a very common problem that you'll have, that, and you think there's something wrong with your data. You think, 
I don't know, the year's not filtering correctly or, you know, you're only getting one type of status through or something's not right with the data. This is what you do. Um, oh, yeah, no, not here. Let's put it in here. So you write cat and that will print to the console whatever you want it to. So you could do this, cat return data. But that's often not a particularly good idea because it will give you weird uninformative output depending on what's in it. So I think if it's null, does it even say null? I think if it's null, it does say null. It depends what's in there, but sometimes it's not really very easy to read. What is a lot easier to read is this. And if all of you know this function, str, it stands for structure, and it will show you the structure of something. So if we just do it on like a built-in data set, it does this. This is really, 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 really useful for debugging Shiny. So if you see, we've written it here. So you can just put this wherever you've got the problem. I'd say this is obviously quite a simple example. So, you know, it, it's pretty rare that you'd be doing, doing something as simple as this, but just to illustrate. Let me just run it and show you. Is that weird screen sharing bar visible to you? Because it's right in my way. I don't know if you can even see it. I'll put it over there. So, yes, look. So, in fact, we sort of have got a problem here, haven't we? Because I put multiple equals true. This is a very common shiny bug. If you look over here, it says tibble 0 by 3. So it's saying there are no rows in this data. And that is quite a common problem. And the reason why there's no rows is because you screwed up the filters. So if you've got the filter, if you like get the capitalization wrong, with a filter, if you do the filter wrong in some way, you'll get no data. And then that can cause weird bugs. Actually, these are handling it pretty well. Uh, I think other outputs are less forgiving. And instead of like showing you something empty, they just poof, go, they just give an error message. So, so we can see now every time I change something, so I put the year in and we can look and it's change it again. And it's still got zero rows. So we're like, oh, okay, well, it's still got zero rows. So what's the problem? So then we put this in. Oh, no, wrong button. And there it is. Now we can see we've got 69 rows. So if you can see here, you've got 69 rows. And here's, here's what they are. It's a date and it's got this and the numbers. If you're still seeing nothing here, then this is really you're starting to narrow down the problem pretty significantly here. So this is probably, other than starting simple and all that basic stuff, this is probably the most the most useful thing, in my opinion, for debugging Shiny. Um, so that's that. What else? Breakpoints and browser. I'm not going to explain breakpoints and browser because um, this is a Shiny course, not an R programming course. But just if you, if those of you who know what they are, basically it's a way of stopping the code. Um, so they do work in Shiny. So I know I said it's a black box and you said it's spinning and, and it is. Um, the problem with using them in Shiny, so you can cause the Shiny application to grind to a halt and then you can have a look for the values just like you can in a normal application. Um, but the problem obviously with doing that is it's not quite as simple as it would be in a normal. When you're debugging normally, you would set the values. You go, well, let's make X7, this, 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 run this function and then stop here. Well, you're not really doing that in Shiny because you're not really in control of what happens. So instead, you just got to set the application running and you've got to put the breakpoint just exactly where you want it to stop. And if the point where it stops, if it gets to your bit of code before it set the um, reactive value that you want to test with, so say you're testing with like, I don't know, a pre-2020 date, if Shiny gets to your breakpoint instruction before you've set the date, tough luck, it'll just stop. There's no way of saying to Shiny, no, 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 you have to do this. So that's why it's tricky, but they, it can be useful. I have used it and you can use it. So just know that you can do that. It just can take a little bit of finessing sometimes to stop in the right place with the right values. So that's useful. And the last thing I want to show you, uh, which always takes a few goes because of, I don't know why, is just run this option shiny.reactlog equals true which I can never remember. I have to Google it every time, obviously. So just run this like that. And then it will do something cool. Let me show you what the cool thing it does is. So then you just run your application as normal. And the way this works, you have to do stuff. So do whatever the problem is. So interact with the application until you get to the point where it breaks. 
So, I mean, obviously this isn't going to break, but we're just going to, this is just to illustrate the point. So we're just going to just add a few things. So you do all the stuff and then it does something you don't want. You're like, aha, that's what I don't want. Right. And then all you do is you press control F3. And you have to allow pop-ups. Oh, that's where it work. And you get this. So this is like a, it can get a bit, oh, this is a fairly simple example. It can get a bit busy if you've got a large complicated application, uh, which is a good reason. Sometimes when you're debugging Shiny, it can help. You know, if you've got a really big Shiny application and a bit of it breaks, it can be helpful to just pick that bit up and just move it into a really small application and then fix it there. But obviously that's, you know, that's basic kind of programming advice, isn't it? But I think that can be very useful with Shiny because it could just narrow down. The number of variables that can cause a problem in Shiny, they do tend to kind of um, increase. Anyway, so this is a summary of everything that goes on. So we start at the end. So if we just click this button at the top left, you can see it will go back to step one. I mean, quite honestly, this is, I think this is quite useful just for learning about Shiny, really. Um, so what this is, you can see it's got all the, all the stuff on it. So these are outputs. These are the inputs. That's the reactive expression. And there's some other weird stuff that's a bit, you can sort of, if you see something and you think, I don't really know what that is, don't worry about it. Uh, you will know more and more about what it is as you get on, but I wouldn't tie yourselves in not worrying about what everything is because it does show you stuff that you don't necessarily need to understand. Um, and you can just click through it. It's very useful. So as you can see, there's a little thing down here. You probably can't read the labels maybe on the screen. It says ready, calculating, invalidating, and invalidate. So basically it starts with um i don't i don't know to be honest i don't know what this is but never mind let's not worry about that um so it starts basically with nothing nothing set when it starts and you can just step through so then you can see here so these b3 b3 these have gone gray that means i don't know what's in me yet and then as you step through so now orange is saying well i don't know what's in me let's find out so it goes orange that means calculating and then it says, oh, well, okay, well, I need to know what's in return data. So now return data is saying, well, I don't know what's in me either. So now return data is calculating. And then return data says, goes over to the green one and says, what's in you? And the green says, I'm null. Then he goes here, I'm null as well. And then he goes green because he knows what it is now based on these two values. And then I just still don't know what that is. <laughs> and now this goes green. Now this knows what's in it. And then the graph goes. And it does the same thing again. And you'll notice this doesn't invalidate because we talked about this because the inputs haven't changed. And if we just step through again, let's just see where I've changed the inputs. We can just watch it step through. Ba, ba, ba. Right, there he goes. Yeah, so I've just, you can see how I've just clicked 2020. So that invalidates that. That invalidates that, that invalidates that. And then they all recalculate. They're all invalidating. They're all going, well, we don't know what we are anymore because we've changed. Then they all recalculate and that goes green. And then that goes green. And then the graph goes green. Like that can be a bit busy and confusing, but um, it can also be extremely useful. So uh, bear that in mind. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just going to give you a couple of extra things. That's the sort of curriculum, really, for the morning. I'm just going to just put some things under your nose, and you can have a look in the lunch break or just in the rest of your life, if you wish. Um, so I just want to show you a couple of things, um, just so you know them. As I said, we're not going to kind of like formally go through them, but just so you've under so you've seen them in your life. Um, <clears throat> So passing variable names, this is a quite a common problem in Shiny. Um, so this is, just, I'm just going to do a very quick introduction now to what's called non-standard evaluation. I'm assuming there are probably people who haven't come across non-standard evaluation. Um, basically, uh, what it is, is it's, it's, using column, it's using column names in functions. That's basically what it's all about. And you can see here, so this is an example from the uh, the tidyverse explanation of how it all works. This doesn't work. So you can't just put bare variable names into functions 
and have them work. That doesn't work like this. You see that it's going in there like that. That doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> before we used to, what did we do before curly curly? You know, I can't remember. Oh, it was all the end quo stuff, wasn't it? The bang bang, all that malarkey. That's all ancient history now. People use curly curly. So this is a way of basically allowing you to pass in bare variable names to functions. So all you have to do is this is the exact same code we had before. It's just got curly curly around it. That's what we call it's what's called. It's called curly curly. And that allows you to pass this in to here and it will group by gender and it will return a data frame group by gender from Star Wars. So that is non standard evaluation. That's nothing to do with shiny, really. I'm just telling you. And people often want to do that uh, because they like quite a common thing is they want to maybe like group by something. So they're like, well, sometimes I want to add up people based on their ages. Sometimes I want to add up people based on their genders, you know, that kind of thing. They want to group by something, a variable. And it's not obvious how to do that because of this confusion here. So, um, but when we're using Shiny, we're not doing this. I've just showed you that to under so you understand the territory that we're in. Because in Shiny, we're not passing bare variable names, we're passing strings. So when you, um, when you build Shiny applications like this one, so this thing here returns a string, returns a load of strings. I think this returns strings as well, actually, to be honest. I think they're, I think they're always strings. Uh, I think it's just, I put them in as numbers because it's more intuitive, but I'm pretty sure it will just, um, it just returns them as strings anyway. And then I think they just coerce back to numbers back again because I was just letting you get away with murder. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, if you've got like a selector that says, uh, you know, group by gender, group by age, group by district, whatever, um, they will be strings. So you can't use this code we've done here because this is not a string, this is a bare variable name. When we're, when we're doing by strings, we do the exact same thing, except we use this. I have no idea why. I'm sure someone out there knows why. I don't think about it. Dot data, double square brackets. And then, the, and then the function argument like this. And then you can pass in a bare variable name like this. I'm not a bare variable, this time, sorry, a string. And that's it. So whenever you're writing shell applications and you want to pass in a variable name, don't use non sign evaluation with bare variable names because it will not work. Use strings and use dot data, double square brackets. And when you can see this is obviously not a shiny example, but this would work. If you had a shiny selector that returned this, this function would work. Uh, <clears throat> that's it. And so this is the exercise, as I say, just to give you something um, to do uh, if you wish to, um, either during lunch or just whenever. Um, so the first thing you can do is you can just change the way that it, it is grouped. So there are week and month variables in here. So you can uh, you can change it to a grouping a month. And there's a there's a group variable in here as well. Um, so you could um, you could change that as well. Uh, and there's a function that I want you to know about, but I'm not going to teach called enable bookmarking. And uh, what that does basically is it puts a little button on the shiny application. And when you press that button, it will generate a bookmark. Uh, well, let's show you. In fact, I've got I've got an application that does it. But that's the name of the function, so you can just Google it. I just want you to know some of the stuff. I just want you to know that it exists rather than uh, us having to laboriously go through everything. Let me just show you there. Uh, Sorry, it's loading a bit slowly. I don't know what's with the server. I've tried kind of tinkering with it, but it doesn't seem to really, um, I can't seem to get it to go any faster. I don't really know why that is. So this is our patient experience application. Uh, this is a shiny dashboard. We're going to build a shiny dashboard. 
I mean, this the way that it looks is a package called Charlie dashboard. Not this is a dashboard. It's obviously a dashboard. Um, we're going to build one. I can't remember. Is session two? Is this session two or session three? I can't. Do you know, I can't remember. That's silly, isn't it? One of the sessions, anyway. Um, yes. So this is the bookmark button here. So it just allows you to. It will. It will basically take all the state of all the all the inputs. So you can put. You can. You know, change the inputs. You can select stuff. Oh no, that's not going to work. The server's responding too slowly. That's just going to break everything. Like this. And then you can just press this button, and it will just bring up a little thing. And then your user can get back to this. So I do say this to people because there are people in my trust who they just always want the same thing. They've got their team or their thing or their whatever. And I just say, set it up how you like it, press that button, get the link, and then just put it somewhere and then just click it and it will bring you back. So that's a nice thing to be able to know about. I say, you don't need to, I don't need to teach it really. That's, you already know most of it, but just have a look at the documentation if you're interested in such things. Right, that's it. I think I'm just going to, can we pause it over lunch or do we stop it over lunch? Right, okay, so this is session two. So we're going to go until two o'clock on session two and then we're going to do the rest of session two and session three tomorrow. Um, so, um, just to recap what we did, basically so far what we've done is we've learned the building blocks of shiny applications, reactivity, inputs, outputs, all that stuff. And we've learned about reactive expressions. So reactive expressions are, I think, the single most important thing other than the basics that you can learn and they're used nearly everywhere. Um, so now we're going to build uh, another application and we're going to do some stuff a bit more on the UI side now because we've been making a big, big sort of cluttered, ugly UI with some problems throughout. So we're just going to make it a bit cleaner and nicer in this uh, in this bit. Um, right, I just said all this, didn't I? Um, oh yes, and we, we talked about non-standard evaluation and bookmarks as well. So um, uh, yes, hopefully that all made sense. I was reading, someone helpfully sent me the dot data um, link uh from the tidyverse explanation which actually did uh help me to understand it a bit so you might want to possibly all that yourself but basically if you want to if you want to select variables with with strings in shiny it's dot data double square brackets that's the that's the simple version <clears throat> okay so the next thing we're going to do and this is probably pretty important as well but i suppose it depends what you're doing is tab set panels so tab set panels are useful because if you don't have tab set panels well, and you don't, there are other ways around it, but this is one way around it. You just end up with what we were doing before, where you're just building, uh, you know, you're just building outputs on top of each other, and they just go down and down and down the page. In web design, there's a concept called the fold. I'm not going to pretend I know a lot about web design because I don't, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I picked this up, and I'm pretty sure it's fairly correct, if not 100% correct. There's a thing called the fold, and basically what that means is where the screen ends. And what they say is people generally won't look below where the screen is, depending on what they're doing. It's a good idea to put all the important stuff at the top. You can't really rely on your users to scroll down because they just can't be bothered, basically. Um, so using tab set panels is a useful way of um, of keeping, uh, keeping it all in the same place. Um, so let me just show you an example of what I'm talking about. It'll be familiar. Oh, that's VS Code. That's the swear word, isn't it? In a in a in our, in our session, writing Markdown and Visual Code over the uh, lunch break. Um, so again, obviously, you've got all this code. So we've we've given up on SITREP now. That was the first. That was session one. Now we're going to be writing A and E, and it's going to be the same application all the way through session two and all the way through session three. And we're doing increasingly elaborate things with it. So the first one we want is A and E first. So I'm just going to run this. <clears throat> that error message, by the way, when it loads, that's, this is deliberate. So you'll have this. If you run the code yourself, you'll have this. This is deliberate. This is what happens when you don't uh, when you don't have clean inputs. And we're going to 
look at that later on. So don't panic if that happens. That's supposed to happen. There's a clean way around it, which I'm going to show you. Um, but this is a tab set panel anyway. It's up here. So you'll, you'll, I'm sure you'll see these on the on the web, on your travels. So this is a graph and this is a map. And you can obviously have lots. So you can have lots and lots of different um, lots of different types of output. So this obviously is a way of avoiding just stacking things endlessly on top of each other. So let's just get rid of that. Put this over here. Oops. Put that there. Oh, I've got two Firefoxes open now. Let's get rid of that one. And this is how you do it, basically. It's pretty simple. Um, the only thing I would just call your attention to is this. Uh, this is an optional argument. It's a good idea just to, as you write them, just throw it in. That's I try and get into the habit. Um, because if you don't need it, then it won't do any harm. And if you do need it, it's already in there and it will just help you remember. What that allows you to do, giving it a, giving it a, a, a giving it an ID allows you to later on to test to see what your user's looking at. Because sometimes it can be important to know what your user's looking at because depending on where they are in the application, you might want to show them different stuff or there might be other stuff that you want to do. You might want to like download data or you might want to make decisions based on where they are. And so you can just throw that in. As I say, it will still work without it, but you won't be able to do that later on. So just throw that in. Um, so this obviously goes in your main panel um, here. Um, and as you can see here, you just put tab panel functions inside tab set panel. You can have as many of these as you like, and you can put as many output functions in as you like as well. So you can put more than one output function if you like, but obviously if you put loads of output functions in, it will just stack them on top of each other again. So you're back to the same problem. So uh, it depends. You might have small things. You might have some little text or something. So you can stack them on top of each other if you want to. Um, so let's build it. So I'm going to close the answer. And again, you're going to need to make sure you've got this data. This is the only fiddly bit that goes wrong sometimes. So this is the data that makes this work. Um, so just make sure this is wherever. I don't, I don't know what you're doing in your file system, but whatever you're doing, just make sure this is in the same folder, because if it's not, it won't work. Um, so let's build an app. So we're going to build an app the same way we have been doing. We're going to go here, new file, shiny web app. I can't believe it was the VPN, though. Honestly, I nearly said that. I honestly nearly said it, and I got distracted. Ugh. Um, and let's call this A&E. Like this and you're going to have again i mentioned the pattern earlier so you're going to have in each case you're going to have um the answer in a folder called a and e first which is here and you're going to have some code to help you write it which has also got the same name as the folder so in this case it's a and e code first so if we just open this up i'll just pop it out Put it over here. It'd be useful, really, if I could have the application and the code and my code on the screen all at the same time, but that's probably too much. Um, so you could possibly run it yourself if you want to, if you want to refer to it. Um, again, I've given you, um, I've given you all the server code. Um, so I'm just going to run through it, and then those who want to kind of tune me out and just have a go can, and those who want to just follow along can also do that. Um, this needs to go at the top. Oh, you know what? You don't need to put the data in. I've changed the data so it loads from the internet because people were getting confused and losing the data and it wouldn't work. So I've actually added this now. So in fact, you don't need to worry about where the data is. You can just do that because it loads the data straight from the internet. You need to load both these packages. You need to load Life Leaflet because we're using a map this time. Um, so that goes at the top above your UI. I mean, I think it doesn't actually matter if it goes to the top, but uh, I wonder if it does. I'm not sure. Might do. No, I guess it probably does. I haven't tried it backwards. Just put it at the top. Um, and then the server code down here is complete. So don't worry too much about what's in here. Um, basically, you've got a reactive like we built before, which filters 
uh, based on the date, as you can see. And then we use this filter data in here to draw a map. This is the this is the render leaflet function I mentioned earlier. This draws a map. And we use the reactive data again here to draw a plot here. So that's that. Um, and uh, yes, you're going to need to add a date. So we can filter by date down here, as you can see here and here. Um, oh, yeah, it's worth saying. Yeah, so date range import. Um, actually, it will return two values um, because there's two there's two date selectors, a beginning and an end, and it will return two. So when you when you're using it, you need to um, just use the square brackets to pick one, pick one out at a time. So you can see what the, all this says is for filter where this is the where this is above the first date that comes out and this is less than the second date that comes out. And I think if your user selects them backwards, so if they select a date that's before the first date in the second box, the whole thing I think will just go completely wrong. I think it will. There are ways of dealing with that in Shiny. I haven't got time to teach you, but it does exist. In general, your users are not going to be that daft. If it if it proves that they are that daft, there are ways uh, there are ways around that. Um, well, so I need to say we've already looked at select import, so we're okay with that. That's a, that's a, uh, selecting trust. Uh, this is the tab set panel function we just looked at, and I think that's about it. Yeah, so we just need to just lay lay the output out. That's the plot output uh, function. That's the leaflet output function. Just need to fill in these controls. So we'll just have a quick look inside the uh, the data, just so we've got an idea of what's in there. Um, let's just clean up the session because we don't need that all data anymore. I'll just go in here, load the data. I'll just pop this out as well. So here it is. So all we're interested in really is we're going to filter by period. So that's here. As you can see, that's what this is doing down here. And we're also going to filter by trust, as you can see here, filter name. So the name is just here. So it's just these two things here. So we're going to build filters basically using these functions for these two variables. And that's it. That's the that's everything you need to know, I think, to get this to get this going. So as I say, feel free to ignore me if you wish and just have a go. Uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to just um, make a start. So let's get rid of all this junk first. Update the title. <clears throat> OK, so the first thing we're going to do and obviously this is the artificial bit, this is the training bit. You wouldn't do this in real life. It's going to copy the whole server thing across. Let's just get rid of all this. I should just realize tomorrow with Zoe, I'm not, I'm going to need to watch the chat, don't I? I'm going to have to figure out how to find the chat when she's not here because I can't see it at the moment. I'll, I'll worry about that another day. I'm going to need to solve that mystery. Where does it go? Anyway. Um, I hope you're talking about the chat now, not the code. <laughs> yeah, I hope I know where the code goes. I'm sure there'll be at least one. I haven't had any mistakes yet, have I? I don't think. There's always at least one deliberate mistake. Let's see where it is. VPN. Yeah, I'm not counting that, though. That's not, that's not shiny, is it? I, I can't be embarrassed about that. Um... Okay, so that's the server file. So we're just going to just copy that across like that. So now we just have to make it work, basically, just like we did before. So uh, let's build the inputs first. So we know we've got two inputs. So one of them is called input date, and it's a date, obviously, it's a date range, as I described. And the other one is input trust, and it selects um, 
by by name. So let's get rid of this. Well, let's get rid of all the UI stuff, actually. Let's get rid of that and that. OK, so we'll start with the date, I think. So the function is date range input. And the first argument, as always, is what shiny is going to call it. And we already know this. You've got to choose the one that I did, otherwise the code won't work. It's this date. So that's date. This is the human readable um, label. And then we need, do you know, I can't exactly remember what all the arguments are called. Let's have a look. Is it from and to, is it? Oh, no, it's not. There you go. I don't know. Start and end. Um, Yeah, so let's put I guess to start we can just have the the first date. Uh that's period, isn't it? Let's make this a bit bigger. And for the end we can just have the maximum. Actually, friend, let's just just put today. Why not? It's a bit more realistic, isn't it? That that's a logical thing to do. Um. Okay, I think that's I think that's everything. Yep. So that's that. Now we need to select input. So as I say, don't forget the comma, otherwise it won't work. Select input. And again, we know the label already. You're going to have to use my label, otherwise it won't work. It is trust. Human readable label. Select trust. And then choices. Equals unique. A attendances dollar sign name. And we don't want multiple, do we? Do we want multiple? Oh, I think it it works both ways, actually, doesn't it? Um, let's have multiple. Let's see. Let's see if we like that for now. Multiple equals true. Oh, I think it was multiple in the answer, actually, wasn't it? So let's stick with that. So that's that. That's the inputs done. Now we need to uh, build the outputs. So, as I mentioned, we just got a tab set panel function. And the tab set panel function itself has got tab panels in it. And the first argument is the human readable label. So they don't have, um, well, they do have shiny readable values. Actually, we're getting to that. They don't need shiny readable values. Um, so this first one is just what it will appear like to the user. And then whatever you want to be on that tab can go in. So you can have multiple things. You don't just have to have one. So for our example, we're going to have tab set panel. I'm going to have tab panel uh, graph. And then plot output graph. And then another comma. And then tab panel map comma and then don't forget it's a it's a special um special output function map i think that's what they're called is it no it's not glad i checked it's in fact called trust map Right, I think I've done everything. Right, let me just run it. I'm presuming I haven't made any mistakes. I'll then recap and just uh, go through everything we've done. Yep, 
Yeah. So as I mentioned, this is a this is a deliberate mistake. We're going to do something about this later. So at the moment, it won't work until you select a value. I think multi yeah, if you select multiple, it does facets. That, that was what it was. I thought, I thought it was probably that. Uh, and then it's about there. And as you can see, so this defaults to the first um, value in the um, in the in the uh, data set, and this is just today. Which is pretty realistic. I think quite a lot of if you've got dates in your showing application, I think they will quite often have today's data in them for fairly obvious reasons. Um, obviously, this is a static data set, so it's just not it's not really going to make any difference. But um, just for the purposes of illustration, right? Okay, that's it. So let me just recap. Um, so we've got all this code done here. We've got a reactive uh, expression here which returns, uh, well, if I've done that thing, if I wonder if I added that as a session into what, in response to one of the, that question that I had earlier, maybe I did. This, you don't, oops, I pressed the wrong button there. What am I doing? Um, how big was it before? No, it was bigger than that, wasn't it? It was like that. Yeah, so you can see I've assigned this here. Oh, hang on, I oh, I, oh, I just copied the, I just pressed the, didn't I press something by accident? Yeah. So this assignment doesn't do anything here. This is pointless, um, but Shiny doesn't mind. It doesn't complain. Um, it, what, all it does is it returns this, which is a data frame filtered by date. Um, as I mentioned, date range input, this thing up here returns two dates. So you can just access them using square brackets, square bracket one, square bracket two. And as you can see, obviously we're just filtering by what's beyond the first one, but before the second one. And then we do some, it doesn't really matter what all this does, but basically we're just drawing a map and drawing a graph based on the values in that reactive, like that. And we've got date range input, which takes a start and an end. And in fact, I think, I think you can run it with, can you run this with nothing at all? I think, I'm not sure if this works. Let's just find out. Can never quite remember how many of the arguments are mandatory because you don't often run them without the. Does that do anything? Yeah, it does. Oh yes, of course. Yeah. So if you don't put anything at all, it just does today for both, which is okay. It runs, but it's a bit silly because why would you want that? Um, so yes, that's what that does. Um, so we've defined, you know, we've properly defined that here. You can give minimum and maximum values as well. That can be useful as well because it can stop your user. For example, your user might go back to 2016. Hang on. So this is the, I think this is the first data point. So if you don't select the minimum, the, the user might kind of go back. You know, might be interested in, they might go back to say April of 2014 and be confused as to why, well, just say 2015 be confused as to why the data is not changing. And of course, the reason why the data is not changing is there isn't any more data in there. So setting minimum and maximum values can be a, just a helpful way of signposting a user to say there isn't any more data, so don't try and select any. And select input we've used before, we're just taking all the values of uh, trust and just um, calling it in here for the choices argument. And we're letting them set multiple equals true because when they select multiple equals true, it makes a nice faceted plot. Like that. And the tab set panel, which is the thing we just learned about, is in here. I haven't put the ID in here, so let's just add that now. ID equals tab set, don't forget the comma. And then two tab panels. You can have as many tab panels as you like, and you can put as many outputs as you like. Um, you just need to have the first argument should just be a label. And that's what your user is going to see and click on. Right, that's it. That's tab set panels. Everyone happy? If you have not written code that works, well, I mean, shout up, that's fine. And we can fix it. We can help you fix it. Uh, but if you find it now or at any point that you have written, haven't written code that works and you want to just crack on and move on to the next thing, then as I mentioned, you've always got the answers. So the answers are just uh, in 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 this case in here, A and E first. So this is the answer. 
I've probably written different code just now than I did in the answer. Uh, so, but it works. So, cool. Okay, so that's tab set panels. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna crack on. I can't see or hear anything at all, so I'm just gonna just crack on. So, next thing. Um, now we're going to talk about, so I've been talking a little bit about changing the UI based on um, you know, what's going on in the application. As I mentioned, the UI is just technically is just drawn once, <clears throat> but there are ways around that. There are ways of making the UI react to what's going on, even though the code is only drawn once. And we're going to talk about that. These are also pretty important. Um, I feel sure that quite a lot of your applications will do at least one of the three things on the screen here. Um, So let's have a let's just uh, go through them all. So when you want to use make dynamic uh, UI, what that means basically is that the the state of the of the UI depends on the state of the application. So as I mentioned before, the UI code is run first and then the server code. So in the normal run of things, you can't access reactive values in the UI, but you can if you make a dynamic UI because what it says is it, is it sets up a little thing that says um, this is where these values go, but they will always be set based on reactive values. So go to the reactive value and find out what they are. And every time those reactive values change, the UI will change. So you'll you'll understand when I show you the code. It's um, it, um, it makes quite a lot of sense. So it's just basically like this. So in your UI, so this is only run once. Oops, I've just clicked on it. This is only run once, UI output, and you give it a name. But Shiny now knows that whenever this updates, it should change what's in the UI. So you just write that there. And then you define as you obviously, you know, this name here is here. Output dollar send data end UI. Then you use the render UI function. And then you can um, you can call whatever code you like. So as with a lot of things that we're doing today, this is quite a um, what's the word? It's not a very realistic example because um, this is not a reactive value and there isn't lots of complicated data processing going on. So this is so simple that really you could just do it in the UI. I'm just illustrating the point. Um, <clears throat> in a more realistic example, you probably would have like say three or four or even more lines of code above this, figuring out various things about the application, reading data, checking, so whatever it is, and then you would call this rather than just going straight into it. Um, because as I say, you could rewrite this whole thing in the UI very easily, but just to just show you how it works. So once you call this render UI, this in here is just perfectly normal shiny. There's no, there's nothing special. There's no difference with the, nothing at all. The only difference is you can call reactive values in here. So you can use um, input dollar sign. You can use reactive expressions, all that stuff. You've got access to all the reactivity. Other than that, it's just the same. And the important thing to know, I don't know how confusing this is. It confused me. I don't know if it confuses anybody else, but I'm always pointing out in case it does confuse anyone. The name of this import for the other outputs is this date, as is given inside here, which is what you'd expect. Don't get confused and start thinking that this is what the other outputs will think it's called. This only relates to this thing up here. So as I say, I feel like maybe I'm a bit kind of um, get confused easily because I feel like I point things out to people that they're not confused about, but um, that's probably more helpful than the way around. What I do for my applications is whenever I'm doing this, I always write UI in capital letters at the end, just to remind me. So I just write what it is, date range, and then I just write UI. And then I know when I look at that, I know what it is. And then when I look at this, I know what this is. I know that this is UI. And therefore, I would never write import dollar sign date range UI because I know that I never write anything where that would be the correct, where that would be what it's called. So that's just a helpful way of remembering rather than getting confusing. Um, I think when you're doing a lot of things, you know, you can get confused, can't you, when you've got a lot of things on your mind. So that's a good thing to do to try and avoid that. That's it. That's dynamic, now dynamic UI. Um, so we'll have a go at that in a second. I'll show you this as well, though. Um, so this is similar, 
in in the sense that it is dynamic UI, but it only it's only dynamic, it only does one thing. It it just doesn't. It's not like the other dynamic UI where you can do anything you like. It just selectively shows and hides things based on the value, based on what's going on in the application. That's all it does. Um, so it's a little bit off-putting, I think, to some people this, because it does have JavaScript in it, um, which I think sounds more off-putting than it is. If you don't, obviously, if you know JavaScript, you'll be right at home. But if you don't, um, input dollar sign my input becomes input dot my input. So people who know JavaScript will be unsurprised by that because you get these dots in, in JavaScript. So that's it. So at a simple level, so this is quite simple input and it's in a string. Don't forget, don't just write it raw, obviously, because it's JavaScript. It's not R, so you can't write it in raw. So if you want to test with the value of input dollar sign my input, you just write condition equals quotes input dot my input. And then whatever it is, you can test for, you know, whatever. Um, that's a simple case. They're not all that simple, though. The thing that threw me when I started doing this is, um, and you know, I don't know what this is called. Um, I should know this, shouldn't I? I'm showing all my kind of ignorance. Um, let me just write some code on the screen so you can see what I mean. Uh, that. The in operator, what's that called? I don't know what it is. That. That doesn't have a really, really simple translation in, in JavaScript. So if you want to do that, it gets a bit fiddly. You can just copy it off Stack Overflow, which is what I did, but I'm just warning you. There's no, like, you don't just replace one punctuation sign with another one and off you go. This, it's something a bit different to that. Um, but just testing for simple stuff like this is pretty easy. Um, anyway, so. You write a conditional Sorry, panel. Can I just ask a question? Yes, yeah, certainly. Hello? Um, on the, the, the dot my inputs, where does that come from? Oh, well, Sorry. it would, it, it would be the name of an input. Then. So, for example, if yeah, it could be this. Sorry, you broke up a little bit then, but I think I heard what you said. So it might be say, I've just given that as just a, as just a, an example name. So it might be input dot trust, for example. So it might say condition equals input dot trust equals Bart NHS Health Trust. And if if input trust takes the value of Bart, then it would uh, it would show it would show the next argument. And if it didn't, it wouldn't. Does that make sense? I think he's written because uh, oh. it was not working. So why is it called dot my input and not input dot trust? Did you answer that? Sorry. Oh, well, this is, yeah. Uh, I mean, this is just an example. Um, oh, he means because this is here. I think he means that, doesn't it? Yes. Sorry. I understand. I understand the question now. Yeah. So That's these are two totally different. So this is based on something else. So imagine you have uh an input defined somewhere else called my input with two values yes and no and the yes means yes i do want to show the trust selector and the no means no i don't so it would say what is the value of this if the value of this is yes then draw this and if the value of yes is not if the value of of this isn't yes then don't draw it so it just it shows this depending on a different value Is there anything else in the chat? Is that is that all right? I wonder if I can see the chat. It probably floats across the screen a bit. That's the, the thing about it. So I always put it on the other screen that's not active. Yeah, there it is. It says, um, my input is a box shown elsewhere in the sidebar panel. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's indeed that, exactly that. Yeah. 
we're going to build it in a minute. So once we built it, you'll see a real example. Um, so that's conditional panel. So they just do one thing. They just either show something or they don't show something depending on another value. So it's quite a simple approach, but it's quite it's quite a common thing to want to do. So it's quite useful. So that's another type of dynamic UI. Um, <laughs> right, sorry. Um, yes, I heard probably about probably 60% of what you said, but not all of it. Um, <clears throat> And the last thing to talk about is um, these error messages. So let me just run the application again so I can show you the error messages that I'm talking about. So when it first loads up, because there's no value in here, you get a red error message. And it says fasting variables must have at least one value. This is when you're developing. When you put it on a server, it, it's sort of even worse. Well, it's not worse. It's kind of it, it's even more obscure, though. Because it because it's on a server, it doesn't show the error message because of security considerations. So it just says something like, "There's an error with this application. Please consult your administrator or something." So it doesn't say. It just says, Ugh. Um, and we don't really want that. We certainly don't want it as like a default view. It's bad enough your if your user kind of gets himself in this state, that's quite bad. But for them to land on an application that doesn't have a, a sensible kind of opening, you know. They'll just think it's broken. They'll turn it on, look at it, and think, oh, this is broken, and turn it off again. So we don't want that. So the way we avoid that is using these two functions. And they they do a similar job, but they're slightly different. Uh, sorry, let me just pour myself some water. So the first one is REQ, which I'm assuming stands for require. And what, what require does is it will just stop Shiny from running any code below it. So you won't get any error messages. You won't hit any APIs. You won't run any reactive functions. It doesn't do anything. It just reaches that point and then just stops dead. So that's quite useful if you want to check to see if your user is getting themselves into an impossible situation. You can just say, no, just stop. Um, the downside to that is, I mean, it depends what you're doing. Sometimes that's really useful. That's all you want to do, um, particularly if the user is just waiting for value. Sometimes if the user just waits another 10 seconds, it will have a valid value and it will run. And that's when you do want require. Because what, you, what basically what you're saying to your user is just hang fire. Don't read any error messages because I'm still working on it and then it'll appear. But if the application is never going to rescue itself, like in this situation. So if we use require here, it just would be blank. That's not really that useful because the user's going to be like, well, I don't know what the problem is kind of thing. So in that case, it's better to use validate, which as you can see down here. So validate takes itself a function need and need has two arguments the first one is something that you need to have some sort of sensible value and the second one is an error message that will um that will display until that has got a, a sensible value so let me just show you what a sensible value would is i always look this up on the documentation because there's quite a few um I'll tell you what, let's look it up in a realistic way because you're not going to go straight to that because you probably don't remember all this stuff. So it's in here. We're looking validate. Um, so blah, 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 blah. What you're looking for, if any of the conditions fails, I is not truthy. And if you see, you can click this. So if we just click on this, it will show you. These are all the values that don't count. So this this function wants something other than this. So false is no good, null is no good, empty string, empty vector, tra you know, there's some kind of strange ones. Um, errors, obviously, that's a good thing. Um, action buttons, that's like a shiny thing. We don't really cover that, but I'm sure you'll come across it. Um, but yeah, basically what that means is if your user's got a button and they haven't clicked it yet, that button will not return a valid value. Um, the main thing it will be is null. That's the most common because when an input is on set in Shiny, its value is null by default. So very often, if you test this, it will be null. But there are lots of other things where it will fail. Obviously, false is quite useful as well because sometimes they'll be false. Uh, and sometimes you get empty strings. It kind of depends what you're doing. So that's it. So let me just show you what it looks like. Um, and then we'll build it probably got time to build that i would think in the last 18 minutes uh, but if not we can just pick up the last little bits 
tomorrow. Um, so I'm just forgetting, is it second? Oh, yes, second. <clears throat> yeah, so you can see here. Instead of having that horrible red error message, it's gone grey now, obviously, because I've stopped it. But instead of saying this fasting variant, which just doesn't mean anything really, it just shows a nice uh, error message like this police like to trust, which is just what uh, this one does. So, unless this has got something in it, show this, which as you can see is what this is doing. So, this says nothing, and then you select something. And then the error message disappears to be replaced by a graph. So that's a nice friendly way of dealing with errors in your application. Right. Okay, let's have a go. <clears throat> so we're just gonna build on top of what we've already built. Um Except I'm not, of course, because it will break everything. So I'm just going to just ignore me for a moment. I think I'm just going to copy. Uh, what is this? Set up first. Yeah, so I just need to copy what's in the first one, don't I? A &E first. Let's just copy this into there. Yeah. <clears throat> um, we just want this these code helpers here. Let's pop this out. There we have it. <clears throat> okay, so let me just show you everything that we need to make this work then. Um, so this is what we've got so far. So we're going to need this ID that I mentioned. Did I put that in in the end? I think I did, but then I'll put it somewhere else. So we need this. And the other thing we need, this is what I mentioned earlier, is this. We need to, we need to give it a value. And the reason we need to give it a value is because we're going to test to see which one they're looking at. So you need to define an ID in the tab set and a value in each one of the tab panels. And once you've done that, you will know what your user's looking at. And we're going to use that. Um, because, oh, sorry, I've closed it now. I'm not, let me just uh, reopen it. Uh, it's here. Because what we want to do is, as you can see, this says police like to trust. But then when we're on the map, we're going to get rid of that. Because this control doesn't do anything when you're on the map. Because this selects individual trusts and draws a graph of them. It has no meaning over here. So it's usually good practice. Depends on what you're doing. But very often, it's good practice where if a control doesn't do anything, you should hide it. Because users tend to assume that if they can see something then it will do a thing if they click it. So if you leave it up, they'll click this and they'll expect it to either be selecting the map or they'll they'll be looking for some sort of behavior that's obviously never going to happen. So it can be a good idea to hide it. And because we want to hide it, that means we need to know what they're looking at. Um, and that's what that's what the, these are for, these values. So we need an ID there and a value there. This is the dynamic UI that we talked about. So this goes in the UI. Um, in the UI bit. And as I mentioned, I tend to put UI at the end of mine just so I know what it is. That's the extra bit of server that we need to make the uh, to make this work, the render UI function defined for this. Like that. Um, and this is a conditional panel. So this input dollar sign tab set. 
So let me just show you how that's made up. So this tab set here, that name is coming from here. So whatever you call this, well, it will then set up a value called input dollar sign tab set. An input dollar sign tab set will now return whatever's in here. This thing here. So when when they're looking at the graph, it will return this value. This will return this value. And when they're looking at the map, it will return this value. And that's what we're doing down here. We're testing for does input dollar sign tab set equal graph. And then these are the validate and the need things that we can add. I say you probably want to use validate, but I put I put them both in just to um, just to illustrate. Okay, that's it. So uh, let's have a go. Let's just make this a bit bigger. So I say if you want to just ignore me now, then please feel free. You should have all the raw materials to do it now. Um. So, uh, <clears throat> just going to add in values here. And again, you're going to have to use my values, otherwise it won't work. So that one's called graph. Doesn't really matter what this one is because we're not testing for it, but let's put it in anyway. Val equals map. And then we're going to take out this date range. And we're going to make it um, dynamic. Um, so the way we do that is just by taking this and pop it in there. Like that. Don't forget the comma. And then we're just going to take this whole thing out, as I say. So there's nothing special about uh, about the input functions in Dynamic UI. They just look just as normal. So we're now going to define that down here, like this, down here. As I say, this is an artificial example because, as you'll notice, there aren't any reactive values in here. So you could just as easily call that um, outside of the. Um, <clears throat> you could just as easily call that inside here, but it's just for illustrative purposes. In a, in a more realistic example, there would be some sort of uh, reactive value or reactive input in here, but it's not complicated enough to warrant that really. So that's that, and the conditional panel. Um, and do you know what? I've just noticed that it, there's the first, that's the first deliberate mistake. I'm sorry, there's a typo in here. I tinker with the signs all the time and they get out of whack with each other. Um, because that's obviously from an older version because that won't work. So this sort of deliberate mistake here is there's a reactive value here, but of course this won't run because it's going to go in the UI. Um, so we need to replace that with the name of the data. So I'm sorry about that. That's my mistake. Oops, Daisy. Let's just get rid of that. All right. uh, need to update that in the slides, actually. Sorry, let me just make a quick note to do that after the session so it's right next time. What is this A&E second? Remove. I can't what it said now. No, oh, yeah, filter data. from conditional panel. Cool, right, I'm sorry. <clears throat> okay, that's how it works. Um, yes, so at the moment, as you can see, we've got this here. So we're just gonna, basically all this does is, as you can see, it just wraps this. So inside, just like inside, a render UI function that's perfectly ordinary UI here. Similarly, in a conditional panel, that's perfectly ordinary UI in here. So if we just get rid of this, what time we got? Oh, we've got eight minutes, that's fine. Like that. And then just copy this in. 
like that. And as you can see, so input dollar input dot tab set, as I mentioned, is this. It's a, it's looking for the value of this tab set with this ID, and it's looking for when it's graph, which is here. Value equals graph. So whenever it's graph, draw this. Whenever it's not graph, don't draw that. And it's as simple as that. Right, I'll just run it now just to make sure it's all working. And then I will. Um, and then we'll add the validate and require in the last five minutes. Don't think I've messed it up, but I may have done. So now if we click off here, yeah, we can see. So as I mentioned, we've made this dynamic as well. As I say, I'm afraid that doesn't really do anything. It's hard to come up with realistic examples of this that don't involve writing lots of code. But regardless, it is reactive. You could put anything you like in here now. Um, uh, um, yeah, we've made the this work. OK, so that's that. Last bit. Let's just pop the code back up on the screen. The code examples is this. So it's just either require input something or validate need input something. Let's just do both just to illustrate. So you just plunk them just wherever you want to stop the code. Doesn't have to be at the top, could be halfway through if you want, but whatever. Wherever you want to check for something, put it there. So we're just going to put it on the graph because that's what we want to stop working. That's the thing that doesn't work properly without this. So we're just going to put it here. Require. But it's not input something, of course, is it? it's input trust. Like that. Then we just rerun. As you can see now, it's just totally blank, which is OK, but it doesn't help the user. They might think it's broken. They might get frustrated and start clicking things and mind it works again. So we're better off really using validate. In order to do that, we would write validate brackets need input dollar sign trust and then an error message. Please select a trust. Get rid of the require. And let's try again. So as you can see now, it says, please select to trust. We select to trust, then it works. Right, that's it. Let's stop recording.